So we've been, we've been reading in Genesis 22, and um, I'm just going to read verses 13 through 19. We've read this several times, uh, but I'm going to read verses 13 through 19. I think I have it split up, Matt, so sorry about that. It's in there somewhere. Yep, it's about halfway through. Okay. All right, Genesis 22, 13 through 19. This is God's word. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram, caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, The Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, On the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord came, or excuse me, called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord. Because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your enemies shall possess the gate of his enemies. Excuse me, I said that last week. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham lived at Beersheba. And the reading of God's word, there you may be seated. Thank you for standing with me. Well, I know all of you have heard of Sir Ernest Shackleton. Sir Ernest Shackleton. He was an English explorer around the turn of the 20th century. So if you don't know about him, you don't know your history very well. Just kidding. English explorer lived around the turn of the 20th century uh, at a time when the Industrial Revolution was at its peak. And and Shackleton had a dream of becoming the first person to cross the continent of Antarctica by dog sled. There's a legend told that Uh, Shackleton needed a tough crew, so he placed an ad in the London Times that read this. Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition, an event of success. Now, history shows that Shackleton indeed chose a small crew and he arrived, but ultimately lost his ship in the ice. Miraculously, he and his crew were all saved. They actually rowed almost a thousand miles in a rowboat to safety. But ultimately, Shackleton never accomplished his feat. Years later, he attempted to accomplish the expedition again, but before he arrived in Antarctica, he actually uh, came down with heart failure and passed away. And he died massively uh, in debt and was largely forgotten uh, during that time. Well, years later, uh, history dug up the story of Ernest Shackleton. And today he's been rediscovered and he's remembered, uh, especially as a person who, in the face of extreme circumstances, had unflinching resilience, courage, endurance, Resilient leadership in the face of a difficult circumstance. Now, I don't know if that ad was ever actually placed in the newspaper, but Shackleton's life certainly pictures a very thoroughly biblical principle. And it gets to the heartbeat of the kind of faith that we've been examining over the past couple of weeks. And I'm going to give this sermon to you in a whole sentence. Here it is. Those who endure the journey of faith to the very end, will finally receive a reward for their labors. Those who endure the journey of faith to the very end will finally receive a reward for their labors. Now, Ernest Shackleton was not remembered for his expedition so much as his steadfastness. And the honor and the the recognition that he so wanted when he was alive came not because he was successful, but because he endured difficulty in the face of the hardest tests. 
And as we come to this climactic moment, the end of this climactic moment in Abraham's life, now, friends, all we have to do is take some time to examine the, the outcome, the result of Abraham's faith. And because Abraham is a, a prime type or example of uh, the believing saint, we can look at the conclusion to this story and see clear connections to our own journey of faith. So far, we've looked at the rationality of faith. We've looked at the requirement of faith. And so today, if you're taking, it, taking notes, we'll look at the reward of genuine faith. This story answers this question for us. What can a believer in Jesus expect to gain by a life of faith in obedience to God and in worship of God? What is the reward of faith? And in particular, I think that God would want to speak to the believer here who is struggling to remain steadfast, especially living in these increasingly difficult times in a culture that offers instant gratification. And I thought about church and attending church. So often we attend a church because we want some instant gratification. So often we attend a church so we can hear a good sermon and get something good for this week while forgetting that God accomplishes His greatest work in our lives over the course of our lives. Friends, God wants to give you something, not just a morsel, not just a taste of who He is. He wants to give you a feast. And that happens over the course of your life, over the course of time. So this is a word of encouragement to you, to the weary saint. Frank Sinatra once sung a song, The Best is Yet to Come. So whether you're a newly saved kid or you've been walking with the Lord many years and you're over 70 years old, <laughs> you're a lifelong follower of Jesus, that's true for you too. The best is yet to come because those who endure the journey of faith to the end will receive a reward for their labors. So three, three aspects of genuine faith we want to examine today. Faith's necessity faith's necessity, faith's supply, and finally, faith's reward. So let's look at these each in turn. If you're with me, say amen. amen. All right. Number one, faith's necessity. We've been seeing in the life of Abraham what faith looks like when God tests one of his children by calling them to a difficult task. Task. And Abraham, who is the father of the faithful, passes the test, the final test of his life, successfully, faithfully, beautiful, beautifully. He takes his son, he offers him up to God, God stops him from doing the sacrifice, and God provides a substitute for him. Abraham proved, friends, as we've been seeing, that he feared the Lord because he refused to hold back from God even that which was most precious. And he committed to God even the future that God himself had promised him. But if we survey Abraham's life, he wasn't always faithful, was he? As we survey our lives, we can say that same thing about ourselves. We have not always been faithful. Abraham, we have seen, has had a truth-telling problem. A truth-telling problem which was rooted in fear and selfish pride. He didn't always consult the Lord when he made major decisions, and that got him into some pretty hot water. In fact, it was his failure to believe God's promises and trust in his word that introduced Ishmael into the world, not the promised son. And yet, for all intents and purposes, Abraham has passed the final test and the Lord is pleased such that here in verse 16, God reiterates his promise again to bless Abraham and to bless his offspring. He says, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord. 
Because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. Now friends, if you've been following along with us, you know this is the end of Abraham's life, isn't it? Abraham is well into his hundred teens. (laughs) No one in here is that old. Hundred teens. And God here comes again and he reiterates this wonderful promise at the end of his life. And actually, Abraham never saw the fulfillment of this promise in its entirety. There's a place there in Hebrews 11 somewhere in the New Testament where it says that God commended Abraham for his faith, but he never received what was promised. The reward would come later. It would be manifested in legacy. One could say that the blessing that Abraham gained here is the knowledge that God is pleased with him and that his children would benefit from his faithfulness. And I can't think of too many better things than knowing that my children will benefit from my faithfulness to God. But friends, as we've been seeing, a whole life has preceded this moment. A life of many tests of faith. Not just this one. Faith that That is that precious slender thread that slowly became strengthened in Abraham's life to the point where his faith is now unbreakable. And so you come to the end here to this this story and you ask the question, what does this have to do with us? What does this old man and his faithfulness to God waiting on the reward have to do with us? The point here is, friends, is that the Christian, the Christian, must persevere to the end if he is going to receive the reward of faith. Perseverance, patient endurance is faith's necessity. Kids, that word persevere means to keep going even when things get very hard, even when you don't think that you're going to make it. That's perseverance. Abraham will receive the promise because he persevered to the end obeying God's commands. Now, did he obey perfectly? No. Was Abraham's worship always pure? No. But when the final test came, toward the end of his life, he was found doing his master's work. You know, the writer to the Hebrews talks a lot about Abraham. And in chapter 6, we'll put this on the screen for you, in talking about salvation, It says in verse 11, we want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end so that what you hope for may be fully realized. We don't want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And he goes on to talk about Abraham, pointing to Abraham. Friends, it's it's diligence, persistence in our faith that yields the promised inheritance. In fact, he says a little bit earlier in chapter 6 that those who appear very Christian throughout their lives, they have a, a Christianity that's external on the outside, but when they fall away under the pressures of life, will prove in the end that they were never actually born again in the first place. A Christian is a person who puts their trust in Christ's work, period. But friends, that faith, as Abraham's life shows, is proven to be saving faith because it brings Abraham and us to the very end. Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, once said, perseverance is the badge of true saints. Without perseverance, they cannot be saved. And if they are truly saved, and they will persevere through divine grace. You see, friends, Abraham shows that the greatest evidence of faith in the life of a true Christian is the fruit that they bear over the years. Jesus said, you will know my disciples by the fruit that they bear. But this fruit takes place over time. When you plant a tree, it will not produce apples for many seasons, perhaps. Charles Spurgeon continues by saying, But how am I to know a person's fruits? 
by watching them one day. I may perhaps form a guess of their character by being with them for an hour, but I could not confidently state a person's true state even by being with them for a week. George Whitfield, who was a preacher a century earlier than Spurgeon, was asked what he thought of a certain person's character. I have never lived with him, was his answer. But if we take the course of a person's life, Spurgeon goes on, say, for 10, 20, or 30 years, and if by carefully watching we see that they produce the fruits of grace through the Holy Spirit, then we can make a safe conclusion. Friends, if we took a look at Abraham's life in Genesis 12 when he was marching down to Egypt, getting ready to lie and put his wife's life on the line, we wouldn't look at him and say, oh, there goes a God worshiper. We would say, what's wrong with that guy? But now that we've come to the end, we can look back over 40 years of life in these chapters and we can say, yes, grace has saved this man of faith And likewise, friends, we too will show that our worship and that our obedience, that our faith is real as we continue to the end. You know what this does for me? Looking at Abraham's life, it helps me to be merciful to myself, one, but to others, two. Don't we run into so much heartache, so much anxiety when we evaluate ourselves or we evaluate other people just from looking at them over the course of an evening or a period of time, maybe a week or a month or even a season of life. It's so easy to judge a person by a decision that they make or decisions that they're making or something they say or things that they have been saying. People that we love, we wish that they would stop being so dumb, forgetting Forgetting that our perspective is only as through a a pinhole of time. I'm going to say something to you. Biblical faith, friends, is more about perseverance than it is about performance. Biblical faith is more about perseverance than it is performance. Don't get me wrong, it is about performance. Faith acts Faith lives. Faith is faithful. Faith is obedient. Yes. But if we make faith only about performance, we will become so discouraged when performance is not there. We'll become so discouraged when we see people that we love being dumb and failing because we can only see them as through a pinhole. But friends, when we take the long view of mine in mind, like we have here with Abraham's life, as, as God does. And we remember that when, when God calls an individual to himself, Jesus becomes not just their instant redemption, but our long-term sanctification. And friends, he is far more patient and long-suffering than we are. That helps us to take our hands off of an erring child. or a harsh spouse, or a harsh neighbor, or friend, and instead keep praying for them. Keep praying for their soul. Because listen, friends, only God can bear the fruit of righteousness in that tree. Only God. So faith's necessity is perseverance. Endurance over the course of a lifetime which leads to our next point, faith's supply, faith's supply. As much as Scripture commands us to be diligent and not to become lazy in our walk with Christ, it it just as much reinforces that our final salvation is all of grace, and grace makes us patient people. Let me turn your attention again to verse 13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns and Abraham offered up that ram there as a sacrifice and he called the name of that place the Lord will provide as it is said to this day on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided now one would think in reading this account that the author wants us to walk away more amazed 
at the Lord's provision than at Abraham's obedience and faith. I say this because this story, as it was told and retold by Jewish people, when the word Moriah came up, an old proverb would have been brought up. Oh yeah, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Abraham, oh yeah, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Jehovah Jireh. Now, if you read the Hebrew, you could translate that phrase in a number of ways. The modern translations are pretty close to the original, but the phrase, it shall be provided, is one word. It's a verb in the Hebrew, and it's in the masculine, and it's in the passive. That means it would be perfectly acceptable to translate that proverb, in the mountain of the Lord, he will be provided. On the mountain of the Lord, he will be provided will be provided. Well, so what? Well, that place, Moriah, would keep showing up in biblical history. Later on, about 1,800 years later, a man named King David would make a sacrifice there on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And then his son Solomon would receive a command from the Lord, a mandate to build the temple right there at that site, the place where David sacrificed to the Lord, the place where Abraham offered up the ram. Fast forward 900 years later from Solomon's time, and Jesus stood on the steps of the temple, that very spot, and said, destroy this temple, and I will raise it up again in three days because he was speaking about the temple of his own body. Friends, John tells us in John 8 that Abraham saw Jesus' day and rejoiced. There on Moriah, Abraham saw that what was happening had a universal significance Because there he realized that the Lord would provide a substitute lamb in one of his offspring, Jesus. And that's why he named the place the Lord will provide. The Lord's provision, guys, was not Isaac. He was not a perfect substitute. He was not sinless. The Lord's provision was not the ram. Yes, it was innocent, but the blood of bulls and goats and animals cannot take away sin. No, the supply that Abraham saw there on Moriah was the Lord Jesus himself. Abraham saw his day 2,000 years before Jesus walked the earth and he rejoiced because he knew that once and for all that his salvation, that his journey with God was all about grace from God. Ed Clowney says that Abraham's ordeal on Moriah happened not only so that his faith might be tested, but that his redemption might be sealed. You see, friends, God has provided once and for all the obedience, the faith that he demands of his people. This provision was in Abraham's day and in our day, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was given up for our sins and raised again to make us righteous in the sight of God. It was because God provided him on the mountain of the Lord that God accepts your worship today even though it is imperfect and is pleased with your obedience today even though it is imperfect. Jesus, my friend, is the reason why when a Christian falls into sin that God is no longer storing up wrath on the day of judgment because the sacrifice has already been provided in him. Jesus is the supply. Jesus is the reason why our meager worship is pleasing to God whether in the giving of our time or our resources or our voices, our song, our prayer, our Bible reading, our evangelism, our active obedience to God's word because Jesus' sacrificial worship was perfect, pleasing to God. Jesus is the supply. 
someone says, well, that's all fine and good. But how do I know my faith is genuine right now, today, on this morning? Well, let me ask you a question if you're asking that question. How do you respond to the trials and the tests that God sends your way? We've been talking about this big test of Abraham. That's the point of all these sermons here. How do you respond to the test of faith that God sends your way? Do those tests anchor you more deeply into Christ and strengthen your faith in Him? Or do they push you away from God? Friend, are you blaming God today? Are you blaming Him for the situation that you've been in for a long time? Maybe you're even ignoring Him today. Romans 5 says, That for the true Christian, suffering produces not weakness, endurance. Endurance. It strengthens our hope in the finished work of Christ to bring us to the end. Suffering and trial is the precision scalpel in the Father's hand used for the express purpose of cutting out every threat to our faith, my friend. Sinclair Ferguson says that God is determined to be frustrating to us. God is determined to be frustrating to you. Why? Because at the end of the day, our temptation is to confuse our purposes for His. So He takes out the scalpel and He cuts away the threats. It's because God's unchangeable purpose is to bless the world through Jesus, his son, the offspring of Abraham. Get this, a plan that will save every last child that Jesus died for. So he must test your faith. He must test our faith through difficulty, through trial, because that teaches us to trust him. When a weary traveler is exhausted and sees a spout, he runs over to it to receive that cold water and be refreshed. Friends, likewise, Jesus is the living water that is most sweetly experienced when the Christian is most weary from the struggle of a hard season of parenting or burdens from the job or an ongoing medical ordeal or a conflict from an interpersonal relationship. Testing drives us to the source. It keeps us calling out for help and relying on God's mercy. God is determined to be frustrating to us. He will not give us what we want today. He's too good for that. He's too good. He loves us too much. So Jesus is faith's supply and provision. He is our righteousness before God. He is the way. And through suffering, we keep our eyes fixed on Him. George Mueller said that God delights to increase the faith of His children. We ought, instead of wanting no trials before victory, no exercise before patience, to be willing to take them from God's hand as a means Trials, obstacles, difficulties, and sometimes defeats are the very food of faith. What's your trial today? What what has wearied you, dear saint, in your journey? I believe God would have you know that whatever's wearying you is actually the scalpel in God's hands to cut away spiritual apathy and cold love toward God. My friend, what if if this scalpel, this test, is the very thing that God intends to use to prove His love to you, but it's something you'll never see if you keep trying to get out of it, keep trying to escape. I want to encourage you, take some time today. Consider 
that because God did not spare his own son in giving Jesus up for you, that he is actively using this scalpel to provide much needed food for your faith. So faith's necessity, faith's supply, and finally, faith's reward. By myself I have sworn, he says in verse 16, because you have done this, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore, and your enemies shall possess, I did it again, and your offspring, it's in my Bible, it's right there, so, and I'm almost 40, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. There we go. One last time, God repeats this promise. This is the last time, actually, we will hear God speak to Abraham on record. And Abraham will go down in New Testament history. Eleven books, in fact, are mentioned, mentioned Abraham as the prime example of faith. But I remind us one more time that Abraham is nearing the end of his life. The blessing of Abraham's faith will not be experienced firsthand, but will be passed down to his offspring, his child. Now in these verses, that word for offspring is in the singular. It's an individual. Paul explains to us in Galatians 3 that The promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring, but it does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. So for Abraham, faith's reward came long after he was gone because it was fulfilled in Jesus, the one that he saw from a distance and rejoiced in. Through Jesus the offspring will be multiplied as the stars of the heaven and the sand of the seashore. Jesus indeed possessed the gate of his enemy when he crushed death, sin, and the devil by dying and rising again. And in Jesus, people all over the globe from every age, of every people, tribe, tongue, and nation will experience the blessing of salvation. Jesus is the source of blessing. And that has been God's purpose all along, friends, to bless the world through him. So often, I mentioned coming to a church building earlier, because so often we come to a church building hoping to get a blessing. Don't we? I'm just going to be honest, I have. I hear this preacher's good, let me sit down and listen to him. Can't wait to hear it. Can't wait to get a blessing. Can't wait to leave today and get on with my week so I can be encouraged, so I can be energized. Great, give me a blessing. Abraham didn't receive his blessing until after he was dead. Is this possibly a model for us, friends? Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying God doesn't bless us now. Don't don't let anybody leave here saying that's what I just said. Oh, he blesses us richly. And I can't think of a greater blessing on this side of heaven than knowing that every sin of mine is forgiven that I belong to him and I belong to his body, that I don't have to even fear death. That's a great blessing and that's why we gather here on Sundays to be reminded of what we actually do have. But friends, the fact remains that our experience of that joy is not limited to the present life. In fact, those who belong to Christ can rest soundly in knowing that whatever pain we feel here right now is the worst hell we will ever experience forever. Unbelievers can't say that. This is the easiest hell they will ever experience forever. This is the worst. For the people of God in Christ, 
reward, blessing, indeed can come in temporal ways like a, a good job or a beautiful day. But these blessings are the experience of everyone. Friends, the Bible teaches your reward, our reward comes later after we throw off the bonds of this broken but mending life that we now experience here on earth. Will it be honor and recognition like Shackleton wanted? Absolutely, but much more. We will live with the object of our worship face to face forever and all of our longings will be met and satisfied. How would you like to not have one longing? How would you like to not be waiting for one thing? How would you like to pray without sinning? When we're with Jesus, it'll be ours. That is the reward. He is the reward. But friends, I can't help but wonder, after all we've said about faith, that there may be some among us who struggle deep down to believe that when the last day comes, you'll make the cut. You know that day's coming. You believe in Jesus you love him. Theoretically, you know his work is enough. You know that he's your supply. But as you evaluate your life, you see so much failure, so much sin, so much disadvantage. You've not obeyed. You've not passed the test. Or maybe you've wrestled with unbelief so long you wonder right now if you're even a Christian at all as you sit here. My friend, today, you must be anchored. You need to be anchored. An anchor is a massive, heavy weight that keeps a ship secure, even in the worst of storms. And in Hebrews 6, the writer goes on to speak about this anchor and his purpose to bless every last person that is in Christ through him. In verse 19 and 20, he's saying that Christ's sacrifice is our ironclad hope, a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. Hebrews is saying that the salvation that God's, God provides in Christ is final, complete, and certain. And those who have run to him for refuge, are spiritually tethered, anchored to him as by a cable that runs all the way into the throne room of heaven and sits in the very heart of the Savior. Friends, I want to say something to you. Just as Abraham's willingness to sacrifice his son and give that extreme act of faith was noble, God still had to provide a substitute, didn't he? He had to provide for himself a substitute. My friend, it is not your faith that will finally save you in the end. Necessary as it is, you will be saved in the end only by the unbreakable promise in Jesus Christ only. So my friend, have you run to him for refuge? Refuge from sin? Refuge in your suffering? If so, though your faith may seem like a slender thread, God is actively strengthening it into a steel cable, one that is eternally anchored into Christ's very heart. So as you endure this journey of faith, and as you face the trials, and as you're storm-tossed, what is it that makes you doubt His love? Are you doubting his love today? Friends, as you look at your life, if, is there a lack of apparent holiness so that makes you doubt his love? As you look at your life, is there a lack of spiritual experiences as you compare yourself to your neighbor, to your fellow church member? Are you looking at those things today? My friend, if you are, those things have you looking down, not up. 
Those things have you searching within for something that only comes from without. Are you looking at those things? I don't know. I don't know what I, I don't know if I'm truly saved. My brother, my sister, if you truly grieve over your sin and you long to love Jesus more, are these not evidences that you've run to Jesus for refuge? Let, let's, let's listen to John Newton's example in closing. Listen to what he says about this. But when I am beaten from everything else, I love that, it still remains true that Christ has died, that he now lives and reigns, and that he's able to save to the uttermost, and that he has said, him that cometh I will in no wise cast out. In no wise and to the uttermost are great words, and upon such unlimited sovereign promises I cast my anchor, and they hold me, otherwise I should be the sport of winds, and waves. Do you doubt his love today? Have you perhaps clung to lesser loves as of late? Things that provide instant gratification. Perhaps you're even in a trial now. And Jesus seems like the furthest thing from you. Everything else feels much closer. My friend, as I close, please take a pastor's encouragement Keep the long view in mind. Stop looking at your life as through a pinhole. Recognize what God has accomplished in the person of His Son for you. His unbreakable promise that cannot shatter in a moment or an evening or a week or a year or a lifetime if you belong to Him. Today, if you have not run to Christ for refuge, what is it that you're waiting for? What are you looking for? The free gift of salvation is offered to you, to all. Run to Him so that He might be your refuge from death, your Savior for sin, and your anchor in suffering. Pastor Aaron would you come lead us in the Lord's Supper? This is a perfect opportunity now to respond to the preaching of God's word.